Okay. So um, I won't talk about this model that Raghav presented. But what I will try to do is something extremely basic um, to set the stage, to sort of set the stage for what Petri will cover tomorrow and what I will do on Saturday. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep have thirty minutes. Is it worth it? Um, I'm going to keep it very simple. And uh, if it's just too easy, too simple, just let me know. That way, yeah, 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 I don't have anything on the slides because this was the this was the last moment addition uh, because Professor Zedza was not talking. It's better. <laughs> okay. So you have you have to tell me if I am writing too small or too big. Um, okay. So the very um, so all of you are familiar with an exponential growth or an exponential decay model, right? So the first thing I would like to sort of do, you know, so all of you are familiar with an equation such as this, right? Um, so the first thing I will try to show you is that, you know, since I'm an ecologist, mathematical ecologist, how do we end up getting an equation like this in a very simple ecological context? And this appears repeatedly, okay? So that's the first thing I will do. So uh, you will see how trivial it might be and how prevalent it is though. And the second thing I would like to do uh, is this, okay? So all of you um, have studied physics at some stage in your life, right? So all of you know that if you have a, you know, some kind of a landscape like this, and if you uh, drop a ball somewhere which is not in the minima, what will happen to this? It will eventually come down to the minima, right? So very simple, right? It will actually go forward. I, you're absolutely right. I, I was expecting somebody will say that. Okay, um, but imagine if you had a very highly damped system, meaning lot of friction, uh, so energy is lost. Then what do you expect? Typically, it comes and uh, gets stuck at the um, you know minima. Okay, so now um, I'm going to sort of make connection between a simple ecological model and exponential growth and this. Okay, is this something you already know? No. Okay, then that's at least one person doesn't know. So. Uh, so hopefully there will be something new. Okay, so let us start with uh, some very very simple. So what do we try to study in ecology? So one of the fundamental questions in ecology is you know how things change over time. Okay, um, it's sort of unlike economic mainstream where the focus is lot on equilibrium. So in, e in ecology, I uh, would like to understand how do things change over time. When I say things, typically we want to understand how do populations change over time. You know how do how do number of species change over time? How does how do population of a given species change over time? How do species interact with one another? How does that influence how both of them change over time? So basically it's all about how things change over time. A lot of it is just about how things change over time. And whenever you want to study how things change over time, what do you write? What do you do? You have a quantity, which could be, for example, population number, and you want to look at the rate equation. You know, how is it changing over time? Therefore, differential equations are sort of you know, very central to understanding ecological dynamics. So that's where the connection to population, you know, the exponential comes in. So how do we, how do we arrive at something like an exponential, you know, uh, growth in a simple ecological context? So let us try to understand some population, okay? Population that's, you know, changing over time. Now, why do populations change over time? Well, they change over time because some individuals die, some individuals give birth to new individuals, right? So let us write that, you know, X is the population of some species. And if I want to know what is the population of this species in the next time step, given what I have today, okay? So what simple equation connects them would be something like this. So there are a number of individuals today and there are going to be some number of births Right? And there are going to be some number of deaths. So, so births will increase the population and the deaths will decrease the population, right? So the simple equation sort of captures you know how population should change over time. Therefore, the, now the simple challenge is how do these you know how can I write something about the births and deaths? So how do you think the births will depend on the current population size? So if you assume that every individual in the population gives rise to some B number of offspring at a rate b, so what would this number be? A reasonable approximation for this is, 
you know, you on an average, sorry? You are a unique net migration. Migration? migration. Yeah, this thing of a closed population. That's a like fantastic question. Think of a closed population that makes our life easy, huh? right? And, uh, and imagine, likewise, if we have a death, death of individuals, if there's some chance of death, then you have a death of individuals, okay? So you have, uh, so in some, in some sense, you know, in, in very crude and naively, we have written down how the births and deaths depend on the current population. I can just write down this equation fully. So what do we have? Lot of XTs, all linear terms, very nicely, very nice linear terms, which means, uh, you know, I can take the XT to the left hand side and divide the entire equation by delta T. And, you know, uh, for those who know limits, I can set the delta T go, going to zero. And what do we have? If I do that, goes to zero, we have B minus D times XT, right? Okay. So the left hand side is DX by DT by a simple definition of derivative. And let's call this R. So in a, you know, I'm sure all of you knew this, knew this, but just to sort of um, uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page. So a very simple, the simplest equation you can think of for how populations change over time would actually look like an exponential, you know, a differential equation that actually gives rise to exponential growth, right? Now, where R is basically the uh, net growth rate because of birth minus death that occur over time, okay? Now, when R is positive, what, we, what do we have? We have an exponential growth, right? When R is negative, we have an exponential decay. Now, let us think about this as a biological question. Uh, let us assume that the growth rate is positive, which means populations will now grow exponentially. Now, um, will that go on forever? Obviously, it won't, right? It has to have some limit. So, what is it that will probably limit them from growing exponentially forever? Shortage of resources, right? So, so conversely, if there was no shortage of resources, what happens to populations? Populations grow exponentially. Right? So in ecology, so uh, when if you see a population that's growing exponentially, the immediate conclusion you can draw is that it hasn't reached a stage where resources are limiting them to grow. Okay? Um, and uh, clearly this will not be true forever. There has to be a time when the resources will become limiting and therefore this equation will not be true anymore. Okay? Yeah. Say that again. Can you? Population, not a general kind of stuff. Then it's like quite kind of debatable actually. What is because, debatable? Because the population growth has not happened kind of exponentially, uh -huh. although the resources has been growing all over the years actually. So the mainstream or uh, whatever population growth theory <laughs> is not about that the resources constrain population. Um, I don't understand the question. There was some <laughs> um, economic advancement and resource increase limits population growth. Oh, okay. okay. Let's. I'm talking about not talking about human populations here. So, yes, that's what I. That if that makes your life easy. That was, that's my first question. Yeah. Oh. So, so one thing you know that's very uh, sort of you know it is true that the organisms do change the environment they live in. Okay, uh, but as long as this is true resources are not limiting, this would still be true, no? So it would be true even for humans, though. I don't know why it would not be true, though. I, that, that part wasn't very clear to me. So this would still be true irrespective of, as long as this condition is true, this would still be true, though, right? 
Oh, that's okay, okay, okay. So in the, in the human population, it's okay, okay. Yeah, so that's it. So I think it also, it also has a very important and interesting distinction between a non-human population and a human population. You know, humans not only, um, you know, just reproduce and grow, they also modify the environment they live in, in intentional ways, you know. Uh, for example, you know, organisms respond to, respond to, um, environment in, in ecology and evolution of course and they also change and modify the environment but all of it is very very local so whereas in human populations something that is fundamentally different is that the because of policy changes that happens on a much much larger scale for example what the prime minister of india says will impact me whereas there is no prime minister of india uh, for an elephant or a tiger population right uh, so so there is that's, that's a fundamental distinction so the the scale of interaction in ecology is very very local, you know. Uh, so what happens? Of course, they you know they can have a cascading effect over larger time scales than the interactions are actually happening, and in fact, a lot of the times we don't understand why it actually happens, and that in some sense forms a very fundamental question. But by design, the interactions are all local. Okay, unlike in human populations, when by design you can actually have a global policy that affects everybody's. In the, in the population entirely, right? So that's a fundamental distinction. Okay, so I'm not trying to model here uh, human population growth, by the way, because that's a different field entirely in itself, and that's not our motivation anyway. So, but the, but a very fundamental principle, very simple principle that follows from this simple equation is that uh, when there are no shortage of resources, populations grow exponentially, and because of the fact that you do have shortage of resources, eventually populations do not keep on growing forever. So in some sense, a large part of ecology tries to understand, you know, when there are no, when there will be shortage of resources, how do populations change, okay? Now there are many, many other factors that come into play. So the individuals now compete with one another for the same set of resources that will change the birth and death rates of individuals, okay? So it won't remain uh, in this simple form, in the, in the simple form, and therefore one can imagine that if I, broadly speaking, you know, if there are n number of species, right? Let's denote them by you know one, two, three, four, you know, i as a general index. So what you would really like to do and then imagine there are lots of environmental factors. So what, what you would really like to do is basically write down a set of equations for how each of these populations are changing over time because of presence of many, many other populations including itself and because of many external environmental factors such as, you know, climate is, you know, the resources, climate as well as, you know, um, um, you know, interactions that the stochastic components in them. And this need not even be a deterministic equation. You could have a, a lot of stochastic term built into these equations. Okay, this forms a very very general framework, you know. And as you can imagine, a set of such coupled equations can potentially give rise to a lot of dynamics that you know uh, Raghav was mentioning. And in fact, uh, what Petri will cover tomorrow is uh, starting with very very simple equations. How you can actually generate some really really complex and sort of you know unexpected behaviors. You don't need to have a lot of complexities to actually uh, generate complex dynamics. That will be one of the main things that, you know, Petri will come out, cover tomorrow. But I will not go in the direction. Um, you know, I will, uh, you know, having provided this broad framework, the next thing I would like to do is the second point there, which is to make connection to uh, that, you know, ball rolling in a simple potential landscape, okay. So how do we do that connection? So let us now, uh, this is, you know, this is a general framework for n interacting species, right? n interacting species or populations. Now, I'm going to restrict myself to a single population to make the mathematics easy and tractable, okay? So in a single population context, so instead of i going from 1 to n, you have only one i. So I'm going to just, you know, denote that by x. And the 
the equation by f of x. So, so the simplest model I derived had a linear form on the right hand side. This need not be the case, right? You know, you can have a more complex form. The, the growth rate of population does not depend linearly on the number of individuals present today, but it could depend a lot more complex ways in nonlinear ways, right? So, so without writing specific, specific equations, which Petri will discuss tomorrow, I am going to write a very general equation now, okay? So let us try to understand some properties of some one interesting, uh, you know, you know, connection to that, you know, potential that I showed there, okay? Um, so I have some function here. Let us assume this is a nice and smooth function in, in mathematical terms. So whenever this is true, do you all agree that I can write it as a derivative of another function? Do any of you have a problem with this? So given any nice and smooth function, I can always write down this as a derivative of some other function, right? Is that fine? It's, it hopefully seems reasonable. So conversely, what do we have? Uh, u of x, I have defined a new function now called u of x, which is basically Uh, negative integral of the the rate equation for the population growth. Okay, this is by definition. There's nothing. I'm not doing anything new here. Then defining a new function. Okay. So before I understand this function a bit more, let us look at this equation. This describes how things are changing over time. So now, when will things stop changing over time from this equation? When will a population stop increasing or decreasing from this equation? Whenever the rate is zero, right? If x is the population size, it doesn't change when the rate of change is zero, uh, somewhat trivially. And which means that this function f of x is zero at that point, okay? So, so those are also called equilibrium points, okay? So equilibria, are basically defined or found by setting this equation to zero. So whenever the function f of x is equal to zero, uh, the population doesn't change and those are called the equilibria, okay? And let us denote them by star, uh, which basically means that if we have, a, if, if we were to plot the f as a function of x, wherever this function intersects the x-axis, those are the equilibrium points, okay? I am um, assuming all of you are also have heard of stability, right? You know, Raghav was mentioning just this morning. Uh, what does stability imply to you? What is a stable system? Or let's say, if you think of population, what is a stable population? Intuitively, what would you call a stable population? Constant, sorry? Uh, that would be equilibria, no? Something that doesn't change is equilibria. Constant growth. Yeah. If population is constantly growing, you call it a stable population. Okay, maybe. <laughs> okay, that's one way of interpreting. Yeah. How about you? Okay. So if I want to connect equilibrium and stability, okay, and if I were to define stability of an equilibrium population, okay, uh, I would prefer to choose this definition, which is if you make a perturbation. The perturbation basically dies off, okay? Okay, uh, so is it a reasonable definition to have? So we have an equilibrium and we can call something as a stable equilibria if the population comes back to it. So imagine the population is not, not changing. For example, this room, right? You know, there are 20, 34 of you, it's not changing. If I just remove one of you, it somehow it gets replaced by some process, because that person really wants to come back to this room and listen to my lecture, it's a stable equilibria. Or imagine a case if I move somebody out, all of you really hate my lecture, another person starts to follow and so on, and this becomes an unstable equilibrium, the entire room just becomes empty. A very stupid example, but actually works well, okay? Um, so I'm hoping this is a stable population size here. <laughs> 
okay that's the definition of stable equilibria okay um, uh, now what I would really like to do I don't know how much time I have um, 10 minutes what I would really like to do basically is to combine the idea of this stable equilibria with that landscape so you, again if I don't tell you any mathematics what do you believe what is the future of a stable equilibria if you compare to that potential well and a ball a stable equilibria is probably the minima of that that landscape right because if I make a perturbation what do you expect it comes back to that point right so that's what I'm basically sort of trying to show you now so how do I do how do we do this first I would like to derive a condition for uh, you know the equilibria okay Maybe, maybe do I even need to do that because I think Petri will do that tomorrow anyway, right? You will do that. I'm trying to see if I can skip that part. Uh, okay, okay, fine. Uh, so now all of you, let's just focus on this for the time being, okay? This potential, this, I have defined a new function, okay? I don't know what the heck that function is. Let us see how this function changes over time. Okay, it's an abstract quantity for now. So it has no real meaning. So let us look at how this function changes over time. So all of you agree that this function does depend on the variable x, right? Okay. Okay, so let us see how this function changes over time. So this function depends on x. So I can do the following. dx by dt, little bit of small mathematical manipulation. So I have um, basically separated the time and the you know, x component, du by dx times dx by dt. So what is du by dx by the way? By definition, du by dx is equal to minus of, minus of the rate function, right? And what is dx by dt is equal to again the rate function okay and what is this therefore minus of f of x whole square so for any given value of x okay okay uh, there is a value of f of x right and for any given value of x, this rate of change of this function is always therefore negative. Do you all agree with this? A very simple mathematical manipulation, but the main point is that this, this function u defined that way will always decrease. Is that point clear to everyone by the way? This is the this is very simple but very important though. No? I mean if it's not clear, just let me know. So ah, yeah, yeah, where it will eventually reach, yes. So the basic idea is this I have this rate equation. So all of you are comfortable with this. Think of let's take a, maybe a, let's take an example to make this very, very clear. Okay. Let's take the example of um, can I maybe erase this part? So let's take the example of this exponential growth, okay? This exponential growth. The exponent is equal to R of x. So what are the equilibria for this? Use the, use the criteria, what is the equilibria for this equation? When will x stop changing? When the right hand side is equal to zero, right? When is the right hand side equal to 0? When x itself is equal to 0, right? So to find the equilibria, you set r of x equal to 0. Assume that the r is not 0, which, is, which becomes very trivial in that case, okay? Uh, is an equilibrium. Okay, let us assume for the sign for the sake of you know simplicity that r is negative okay if r is negative um, what will happen to this value of x is a function of time if 
if I were to plot x as a function of time, what will happen? Any value you start from it will eventually decay to 0, right? Okay. By the way, I am sort of assuming that all of you know that the solution of this equation is x of t is equal to initial condition times e power rt. Is that a fair assumption? I mean, if you don't know, you should just let me know. Okay. So, given this equation, the x changes with time as a you know as a function of time, or oh, x is as a function of time like this. If r is negative, the exponential is a negative exponential, and therefore things decay to zero. So we all understand this equation. Okay. Now let me now phrase this same in the in the in terms of the function u. Okay. Let us what will be the function u for this equation? So how do we define u? So u is defined as negative of integral of this right and what is this uh, what is f of x for this 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 equation r of x hmm? so r of okay and this is just a simple integration all of you can do this this is minus r x square over 2 okay all of you are happy with this I also assume that r is less than 0. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, let me denote r is equal to minus alpha, where alpha is greater than 0. Then what do we have? This is alpha x square over 2, where alpha is positive. Okay. Now, can I plot u of x as a function of x? How will this look like? It is basically a quadratic function with a positive coefficient. How does it look like? Fine. It is a quadratic function as a function of x. Now, what, what is that, what did I really mean when I said du by dt is always negative is that if I, if I start x at any, pol, any value from for this equation, it is all going to go it's all going to decay exponentially towards zero, right? Which is same as if I were to think of u as some kind of a landscape, and if I were to drop a ball there, and that ball will basically reach the minima of this landscape. Okay. So you can think of basically an exponential decay as okay, um, you know, a ball rolling to the minima of a landscape. Okay, it's not just an analogy; it's a mathematically valid construct. Okay, because as long as you define u this way, we have proven that this du by dt, the potential value, will always decrease. It will keep on decreasing, but of course, when it becomes zero, it will just get stuck there. Okay. I mean, you know, be not 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 not, not so I'm sorry, not u equal to zero. But when, whenever it reaches minima in this as a function of x, it can't really go anywhere else because imagine that the particle has reached here. If it tries to go there, what will happen to du by dt? It's going to increase, right? In this direction, it's, it's again going to increase. So it has really no place to go now. Okay. So is that idea clear to you? Um, now, once again, now let's go back to this. Now we defined a stable equilibrium. Right, so for this very simple equation with r negative, is x equal to zero a stable equilibrium or an unstable equilibrium? It's a stable. Why is it a stable equilibrium? Because if we if I make any perturbation to zero, it's always going to flow towards zero. Right? Okay. So and the stable equilibrium will be the minima of this landscape. Imagine I had an unstable equilibrium. How would this look like? without doing any mathematics, it should be the opposite, right? So an unstable equilibrium maximum of this potential. And it's very, very easy to see if we just had r positive. If we had r positive, what will this function be? It will be a negative function, therefore it would look like this, okay? An unstable equilibrium therefore can be thought of as maximum of this potential, whereas a, whereas a stable equilibrium can be thought of as a minimum of this potential. Is that all clear to everyone, okay? Uh, now that all follows from a very simple exponential. That's why I said, you know, 
This model is really, really beautiful. However trivial, however simple it might look like, it actually gives you really beautiful insights. Okay. Now, is, uh, please let me know if you have any more questions. We have 22 seconds. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not assuming. No, this is my definition. Okay, which, which, which? I will answer your question now. Uh, since this is my definition, since f of x can be a lot more complex than a linear function, therefore you can actually have many, many complex forms. Okay, so give me 20 more seconds. So hypothetically, imagine that the u look like this. Okay, as a function of x. Okay. Just hypothetically imagine a U look like this. Then imagine that I start the system somewhere here. Where will this go? It will go here, right? Imagine I start the system somewhere here. Where will this go? It will go here. Okay. And uh, huh? Sorry. Exactly. This is this is, a, this is an example of multiple stable equilibria. Okay. And if it means depending on where you start, you get stuck there unless there is something that will really push you to this. Okay. And imagine another very, very simple scenario, uh, which is what I will sort of cover in a lot more detail on Saturday. This potential is changing with time for some bizarre reasons. I won't, I won't tell you why. Imagine this is changing over time. Imagine it was something like this now t is equal to 0, it's very nice, there are two potential, you know, there are two minima, the system is somewhere here, okay. Now, because some policy changed in, in world, because something happened in the environment, this potential became like this. So, where will the system be now? Let's assume there are no random shocks, nothing, it's just a very peaceful environment, okay. Then, even then, system will be somewhere here, right. Now imagine there is some more changes that happen in the environment because of which its potential became like this. Okay, you're here. Meaning you're basically you are you know if you call this as your basin of attraction, the basin of attraction is slowly reducing over time, and eventually what's going what do you expect to happen as soon as this disappears? It will just fall off, right? Okay, and this is precisely the model that Zeeman uses in his paper. Okay. So he writes down an equation and he shows that as a function of, you know, as a function of certain, you know, changes which are more economically grounded than I can actually explain, this potential is changing and because of which you can actually have a, this, you know, catastrophic transition from one equilibrium to another equilibrium and those could possibly be market crashes, okay. So that's what he claims, but he doesn't use the idea of potentials by the way. He doesn't use this though. He only uses the idea of equilibrium and stability. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I will stop here and then uh, I will take forward on Saturday. This one? Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying that, no, no, no. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. So in fact, so in, in this case, I gave an example where, so if you were to think of x-axis as the population size, so there was a low equilibrium, low equilibrium, low equilibrium, which became a high, equi high equilibrium. And the reverse is also entirely conceptually possible. So it doesn't always have to be towards an extinction. It could also be the other direction. Okay. Which negatives? Here. Here. Oh, it's a definition. Don't, don't ask me why I defined. Because def definition gives me very nice interpretations. Just a definition. Of course, this is inspired by physics literature, though. In physics, uh, you might remember that the force is equal to minus du by know, du by dx, where you use the potential energy, right? Huh? So it's motivated by that. Except that this is not real potential energy per se, as in physics. Comment if, see, the, if you if we want to connect this to, I mean, this is actually what is going on in the, 
the DSG models. If you actually look at the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, you have different blocks, right? You have households, you have firms, you have banks, you have you know different blocks with different all kinds of equations. Fundamentally, what they do is they linearize. They use the Taylor's approximation to linearize at and around equilibrium, assuming each sector has an equilibrium. So they assume a linear approximation very close to the equilibrium point, and they do this perturbation. They give the shock. They just move this, give the perturbation to see how long the system will take to reach, come back to the equilibrium point. And this is what the the impulse propagation mechanism of DSG models. So they initially start with an equilibrium point and basically ask how long will you take to come back. So this is classic. I mean, this is exactly what we do in economics all the time. We, from the equilibrium, we perturb the system to see what happens if there is excess demand or excess supply. So price will basically equilibrate the system. So this is how the potential is actually at the core of what we do in economics. And so that, that's, keep that in mind when you, empirical applications as well as the theoretical models. You'll see when Petri and Vishu talk about that tomorrow. Okay, we'll have coffee now. <laughs>